Hi, so I'm Joan Mulvihill. This was left on our seats. I have never been described as reserved in my entire life. And I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to be reserved now either. And they're recording this, so I have to be good. And um, they're recording this because there are part-time students who can't make it into these things. And that makes total sense to me. Because you know what? You can change all the modes of transport that you like. The best trick is don't require transport at all. So we look at things like smart cities. I, I, my colleague Dave McGaffey is down there at the back tweeting, I'm sure. Um, and uh, we, were, we were at an event last week, or a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about zero carbon for a particular area and you know, low carbon transport. And I said, well, the better option to low carbon transport is zero unnecessary transport. So when you look at things like smart cities and you look at things like congestion, first thing you do is eliminate unnecessary travel. So we're doing an awful lot of travel that is not necessary at all. So I work from home a couple of days a week. I live in Mullingar and I work down the road, but I actually work from home because the broadband infrastructure is there because the company that I work for facilitates me working from home. So actually there's a huge amount of unnecessary travel being taking place. There's a huge amount of people, and we're all delighted you're here, traveling to attend things that could be streamed. So there are students who will watch this at home. Now, they won't get the full live experience of this, but you know they will have a perfectly good learning outcome from their attendance online virtually. So how many of us are traveling when we just don't need to at all? So that was one thing I wanted to mention before I got started. The other thing I wanted to mention before I got started, seriously, I will go back on piste very, very shortly. But I was really interested in what, um, in what Niall was saying earlier on, and he mentioned open data. And there was another thing on one of your slides called innovative procurement. Now, I, uh, there's a man down there called Peter Fry. He's known me for a long, long time, probably back to, oh, 2010 or something like that. Anyway, around 2012 or 13, there's a guy called Dominic Byrne from Fingal County Council. And he was the first person who ever spoke to me about open data. And people like that really did lead the way in the county councils about opening up public sector data. And what they have done on the back of that in the last number of years has been quite a step change for government in terms of how we look at public sector information. And how is open data linked to innovative procurement? Right. Well, one of the biggest issues when I was in the Irish Internet Association for startups, or indeed, you know, even established companies like Siemens, when you want to develop a service that would be consumed by the public sector, you need to be able to trial it. And under public procurement rules, none of these startups were allowed to trial anything because they said, well, you, we, it would give you competitive advantage. They would be seen to be giving advantage to one supplier over another, so they couldn't let anyone do it. So open data actually was really critically important to open the gateway to allow startups <coughs> and private sector companies to test what they were developing. So actually, I think that's part of that, this move to a more innovative procurement. Niall also mentioned um, the idea that, you know, or I think it was not, yeah, I think it was you, um, that mentioned this idea that, um, you know, cities are wanting to see what the technology will enable them to do. Well, technology won't enable anybody to do anything unless the technologists, the providers, people like ourselves, are working closely with our market. And that market is, in the context of smart cities, the public sector. And the quadruple helix of innovation, and I see my buddy Kieran is down the back one of the part of the my little our helix one of the quad so the quadruple helix of innovation um, is based on the principle of open innovation and the quadruple helix so who are the four in the quad that is industry government citizen and academia and it's those four working together that can deliver these kind of changes none of them working individually so if we're developing a product or a service for example for our manufacturing customers What's, what do we do? We spend loads of time with our manufacturing customers. We understand what their requirements really are. We don't develop technology that is then going to look for a solution. You develop technologies in close partnership with your customers. And that's where we all need to work just a little bit more closely together. So 
that's me little off-piste bit done. Now I will divert my attention to my presentation. So I want to talk to you about smart cities today because that is, yes, indeed, the theme for the entire afternoon. So what could I possibly tell you about smart cities that somebody else wasn't going to tell you? So I thought I'd better tell you about what Siemens did specifically. Um, this is not the specific bit. We did not populate 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. No, I've got ahead of myself. Yes, but there will be 20, 10 billion people living on this planet by 2050. And 70% of those are going to be living in cities. So that is the scale of the challenge. And everybody is very, very clear about the deadline, the looming deadline of 2050, because that is also our tipping point for ecological disaster. So we really need to sort this stuff out. And ultimately, Siemens have been around for a very, very, very long time. And our job is to always be at the cutting edge. So Obviously, in Ireland, we're all sitting here now in this beautifully electrified, uh, on this beautifully electrified island, which Siemens built in terms of Ireland Crusher. We're told to be over that story, but actually, I love the fact that we were the ones who electrified Ireland. Um, and that was a huge transformative investment by this state at that time. We were either going to bring electricity to every single home in this country, or we weren't. It's a zero-sum game. You don't do it for some of it. The challenges around broadband will be exactly the same. Because these are the things that underpin where we go in terms of delivering any real strate strategic cohesive plan. So it is ultimately about the next generation. Um, we were, I said, Dave and myself were at a meeting there recently, and uh, they were talking about zero carbon by 2045. And we thought, this is an excellent plan. Till I looked around the room, the statistics in this room would be a little bit better. But I said, who here was born after 1977? And most of the room put up their, very few of the room put up their hand. And I said, well, by, 2040, by 2045, zero carbon, that'll be grand. Half of us will be dead and the other half will be retired. So there's four of you left in the room. Ye can finish it off because we'll be gone. So these are ambitious targets. But what does actually a smart city mean? Like, we just stick the word smart in front of everything. A smart this and a smart that and a smartphone. When my sister got her smartphone, she said to me, crikey, Jonah, I think I'm letting the phone down. She felt it was smarter than she was. But it's not about being smart. It's about being safer. It's about being greener, cleaner, more responsive. Defining smart cities or smart anything in terms of the value benefits it has to the people who are consuming it. And government don't consume cities, people do. So all of us are stakeholders in all of this. So <coughs> I want to tell you a story, very Dickensian or not, a tale of two cities. No, a tale of five cities. So this is a project that Siemens undertook over 18 months across five cities. Aberdeen in Scotland, London in England, Brussels in Belgium, and bonus prize and free answering of a question not to anyone who can tell me Alba Yulia is. Any takers? No takers? Okay. That is the city capital of the county of Alba, outside Transylvania in Romania. And Kartal, which is in? I heard someone say it. No? Turkey. Okay. So this is a project we undertook over 18 months across five cities. Um, in Aberdeen, we looked at harbours. In London, we looked at transport and energy. Brussels was all about security, and I don't mean IT security, I mean actual physical security of people. In Alba Iulia, we looked at connectivity and cartel, it was about buildings. And what we wanted to do, and this is where the other speakers have been absolutely teed me up beautifully, thank you very much guys, it wasn't about the technology. It wasn't about the money. It was about the citizen. So it was all about how do we measure value? So people think Siemens provide kit. We do. We provide loads of technology. David will sell it to you any day of the week. Isn't that right, David? Smart meterings, electric vehicle charge points, he is your man. But what we also do is we provide strategic consulting and support to people who are about to undertake these kind of projects. 
it's not just about the kit. What we, what we recognize is that it's actually always, and it always has been, about <coughs> delivering value to our customers. And yes, we engineer the very best product to deliver that value, but we understood what it is you needed in the first place. And that is where we all have to get our mindsets. So this is what we did. You'd wonder how you do a smart cities project in 18 months. Truth is you don't. But what we did do is undertake a project over 18 months, which took in 350 different data points across all the cities, focusing on the specific areas that I've just mentioned. Transport, harbors, security, energy, buildings, and connectivity. That's it, yes, I'll remember them all. Okay, so what we wanted to do is say, right, okay, these are investment decisions by government. And I, and I really do, and I, and I said it here tonight as Alan was speaking, there is a problem, and that is, the government, we push it out to local authorities and we make it, well, okay, let the local authorities do this. And then you're asked the question, why don't we make transport, public transport free? Because that is not in the gift of most local authorities. That is in the gift of national government strategy. And so they are, there are constraints when we approach these projects at a local area and they need as much support from a national government area. So that is to say, everything that's been done by local authorities, to my mind, is absolutely phenomenal because actually we're all working with the constraint, within economic constraints. So that's when we have to think of the bigger picture beyond what is the financial return on investment? Well, if you're in government, and this is all policy stuff, the return on investment is not just financial. It has to be more than that. These are not commercial entities investing in infrastructure. These are governments investing in infrastructure to deliver policy to people. So what matters to people. Yes, we do want a thriving economy, that does matter to people. Driving economic growth and jobs, that matters to people. But so is their physical security. So is the quality of the environment that they live in. And we have to be able to come up with some metric or some measure for calculating what that is. And that is what Siemens worked on for 18 months with these five cities on these very specific topics. And it was all based on existing proven technologies. So there's an awful lot of coulda wouldas and there's an awful lot of we might be able to and big future thinking in terms of smart cities but an awful lot of what can be done and needs to be done already exists. These are not experimental technologies. These are just if you were to deploy them wholesale in cities what could you deliver? So I am going to give you in four and a half minutes would I let you down? In four and a half minutes, what the return on investment was. So this is the methodology we use. So the normal value of a project under the normal cost benefit, if you were a public private sector company and you were investing in this, you put money into it, what do you get out of it? Next level is what are the other value benefits to the investor, as in the person putting it in? Around efficiencies and you know other kinds of savings. So cost avoidances, stuff like that. I can tell I used to work in procurement. I got half my money was save us loads of money on this on direct price and the other half you're allowed credit for value. But then because this is the public sector, this is cities for citizens and the people who live in it, you have to take in the value of the project to the city, including the stakeholders that are not investing not financially investing, but our stakeholders are participants in that city. And then finally, the value of the data and the digital economy. So these are the exponential value benefits that you get from coming up with new revenue streams or sources of opportunity for a city. I think it's really interesting when we say about you know, digital services. And a lot of what we do in terms of digital services are what I call faster horses projects. You take an existing process and you put it online, so you're doing exactly what you used to do, you're just doing it faster. But there's nothing essentially transformative about that. So actually there are other projects, I, he's looking at his watch, there are other projects which are more transformative. Okay, moving on. Okay, London, energy and transport. I am not short of energy, but I am running out of time, so I'll transport as quickly through this slide. Um, and if you want to know what all of these things technically, when it comes to Q&A, Dave is your man. Okay, virtual power plants. 
flexible AC transition systems, smart meters, digitally connected LED street lighting, lighting. All of this was happening in London. They were trialing it around that arc of transformation in London. And then from a transport point of view, looking at real-time network monitoring, off-street parking, asset management, modal shifts to e-bikes. I love that. Just leave your car at home and take a bike instead. And then looking at the new revenue streams. New revenue streams thought were really interesting. New revenue streams being variable pricing on certain roads. So obviously when you go through the port tunnel, anyone who works with anyone in Enterprise Ireland, the deal is, can you get on the road before the port tunnel meter hits to 10 euros to get through it? And how desperate are you to get to a meeting on time that you'll just risk getting past that 10 a.m. thing? Okay, so these are all tr technologies currently exist. Load stuff happening, happening in Dublin already. This is what we did in London for that. So the energy saving, 304 million in direct and indirect benefits. Now, these benefits were calculated over an annual basis for 35 years, but annually, on average, this is what you would get. 55% are indirect, coming from new energy delivery models, consumer behavior, changing consumer behavior. So I, understand, I really like the question about free transport. I hear the argument for it. I totally hear the argument for not doing it. But actually, we have to look at what ultimately will drive bad use of language, change customer behavior, less driving. So I loved that four pictures and none of them actually changed because you're just replacing cars with cars. Cars with a different kind of car, but you're not solving the problem. Although I would suggest that the sh car sharing thing might work, as in reducing the number of cars. But um, transport, 251 million in direct and indirect benefits of smarter transport measures. Now, I am flying through these. This is your teaser to go and read the full document, which I will share with you at the end for it to find it. But I knew I didn't have an awful lot of time. But it was really about understanding what are the benefits and value and how do we go about it. So anyway, in Cartel, we looked at buildings. So what could you do in buildings? Right, so we were looking at various things like smart controls and sensors. Totally exists. You walk into a room, the light comes on. You walk out of the room, the light goes off. But there are loads of other benefits to stuff that we have a fabulous project called Enlighted. And it's actually been really, really useful for things like emergency services response teams. So when they get to a burning building, that system can monitor where the last person walked. So the emergency services guys are not going checking loads of rooms that no one has been in for six months. There's rooms like that in every building. I worked in this building long enough. OK, so um, data enables building management systems and advanced power electronics. So all of these things can make buildings much more efficient. What are the level of savings you could get? There's my typo. I did tell you I had a typo. It says ration. I meant ratio. 24 to 1 cumulative net benefit cost, benefit to capital cost ratio, a five-year payback period. Now, if you consider the cost of half the new buildings that are going up at the moment, a five-year payback period for even if you're uh, one of those cuckoo funds and you're buying entire apartment blocks for new cities, it's not just commercial buildings, but actually we're doing a huge amount of build to rent for social housing at the moment. So the people who are investing in those, they want a really, really re good return on those buildings. So how do you make them more efficient? Five years payback. Okay, 14 times the average return on investment across three cities when they put them together because some of the projects were running in multiple cities. And 29% of the benefits were arising from carbon emissions reduction. So that is the real hot, literally, topic at the moment. Um, that's what we did there. Now, security. This does smack a little bit of Minority Report. Who has seen the movie Minority Report? Really? <laughs> Tom Cruise? The whole, this thing? Predicting murders? No? OK, read the report and watch Minority Report. OK, that's homework. Right, so Minority Report. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Brussels, what did we do in terms of security? It was about detection control, prediction, and prevention of crime. So isn't that interesting? Detecting crime, we get. Predicting crime, that's where the Minority Report comes in. Now, in that movie, it is doing it's deep into reading your thoughts and dreams. And if you ever dreamt about murdering somebody, chances are you're going to get arrested imminently. This is a little bit more scientific than that, um, and less sci-fi. And it is really about understanding where crime is most likely to happen in terms of where people are accumulating um, and what's going to break out and kick off. So you could do prediction and prevention. Absolutely phenomenal results in relation to that in terms of response times, um, 
crime prevention, but 16 billion of value of cumulative direct and indirect benefits in terms of security and policing costs. <laughs> Speed response times much faster, reduce the impact of unplanned events. So part of this around security is unplanned events like a fire, a major car incident, the response times of getting people out there, clearing instances, less likely of things to actually get out of control, and a two-year payback on investment. Okay, in Aberdeen, harbours. Harbours are disgusting, smelly things that are full of diesel fumes, and God knows the Docklands should have been in this project too, because you know what? They have a huge opportunity there through... Now, <coughs> I did have to read up a little bit on what a gantry crane operation was, because it's not my first language. But yes, container yard and gantry crane operations, that actually if you could automate some of that, you'd reduce things like accidents, you'd reduce things around human, um, human error, um, also, GPS tags for shipping containers. I mean, I was rather surprised that they hadn't been doing that like for years and years and years. Now, they do do it, but actually, if they were putting in GPS tracking and using it then for better route analysis, tracking and tracing, what benefits could you see? Well, a 39% level of over... How am I doing? Two minutes? Wrapping, wrapping, wrapping. And an Alba Ulea connectivity. This is the most obvious one. Wi-Fi points, geospatial beacons, tourism apps, all of that about people, how people interact there in a city. But the trick is, and this is why I'm just looking down there at Alan. So we did have this whole thing around how you would actually calculate the, re the methodology for calculating the return on investment. So that when the local authorities are making these kind of decisions, there's some stuff there that you can use that will help you make all those decisions. And this is what all the payback was. So really, anyway, it is about creating cities that care. Now, I have to tell you, um, so we know each other. And uh, we'll be meeting in Kong in a, in a week's, two weeks' time. And my bio says at the moment, she's annoyingly happy right now. You've been warned. And I am annoyingly happy right now because I actually find what we're doing in Siemens incredibly exciting and uh, David and I are off to Letterkenny again next week I mean the road trips to the lads would be worth the job for that alone because we get to meet really really interesting people doing the really really cool and exciting projects that actually make you excited and glad to be going to work and uh, that is a lovely organ place to feel and it's about creating cities that care but I actually feel I work for a company that does care too so these are the kind of projects that we involve ourselves in the kind of research that we do um, and so I uh, their full report write it down Siemens.com intelligent infrastructure so the full report is there the methodology all of that I had to put in one about financial models because I know that Pierre Andrew these are the kind of things that it's going to keep you awake at night. You love this stuff. So anyway, I am Joan Mobile, uh, and I'm the digitalization lead for Siemens. And Dave McAfee is down there, and my colleague Zoe as well, who's just over for something else. I told her to come in and watch the show. So thank you very much. Am I on time? Whew.